Beginning in verse 1, now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Father, I uh, pray that as we look into your word now that you will open it up to us in a whole new way. Help us to understand it better as a result of having been here. Help us to understand you better as a result of having been here. And then Father, it would all be a waste if we didn't go away and live better as a result of having been here. And so that's our prayer, that your Holy Spirit will move among us here and that he will continue to move among us as we disperse so that we become your instruments in our world to bring people to Jesus Christ. Pray that in Jesus' name, amen. An elderly couple uh, digging around in the basement one day, you know, cleaning things out, and they came across an old lamp. So naturally, they're cleaning it off and rubbing it, and of course, a genie appeared. And uh, genie said, you can have three wishes. So they were discussing how not to squander these three wishes while the wife was getting dinner, and then dinner was put on the table, and it was stew. The guy didn't like stew. And so he said, I, stew again? I can't believe this. I wish I had a good Polish sausage. And voila, right there on the plate, a nice Polish sausage. Of course, the wife was very put out about that. She said, you old buzzard, what a, what a waste of our first wish. She said, I wish that thing was on your nose. And voila, <laughs> there it is. You can't pull it off, can't eat it off, can't get it off any way they tried, it was just there. Finally, in exasperation, the wife exclaimed, you know, I just, I, I, I wish that thing was off your nose and back on the plate. And so there it was. So after three wishes that they had squandered, they had nothing to show for it but a Polish sausage. Now, I know some of you guys think that's not all bad, a Polish sausage <laughs> isn't all bad, but I think we'd all agree if we had three wishes, we'd like to do better than that. So a disciple asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives a simple answer consisting of five petitions, simple yet profound, an opportunity that we can either squander or that we can use in a powerful way, beloved. Now we've looked at this prayer the last few weeks just from a high level, but we want to begin today to look in detail at this request and understand it as thoroughly as possible so that our prayer can be informed by what the Lord has to say about it so we don't squander really the most wonderful opportunity we have to address the creator of the universe. These requests that Jesus gives in this prayer break down really into two Pieces, as you can imagine, there are needs is related to God and there are requests related to us. So this morning I'd like to look at the, at the requests as related to God. Now first of all, notice to whom the prayer is addressed, right? It's addressed to Father. I have to say honestly, it's my favorite part of that prayer. To imagine that we can come to the creator of the universe and address him as Father. That, beloved, is priceless. We have that right, the Bible tells us, Paul informs us by virtue of our adoption. Romans 8.15, he tells us that you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The term Abba that he uses there is the term that the Jewish people used 
because it represented the sound a baby would make as it's trying to learn how to say Papa, right? It's like, it comes out, Abba, you know, it's, it's a little messy, but it's the, it's the sound of a child addressing his father. And that's the picture that the Lord is giving us here. It's like a little child climbing up into the lap of his father. So the child, you know, climbs up into your lap, gives you a hug, starts to talk about something, and then gets distracted, and they're off before, you know, the thought is even finished, right? So what does dad do? Say, hey, get back here and finish the thought. Is that, is that what you do? Of course not. We understand the limitations of the child. We're just glad that they came and spent a little time with us, right? That's all kind of wrapped up in this word, father. He knows our limitations, <clears throat> far better to come and to spend some time with him in prayer than to worry about getting it perfect, than to worry about getting it right. You really can't do it wrong, okay? There are ways and things that we can learn about prayer that can help us in our prayer life, but the main thing is to do prayer. Now, the fact that it's addressed to the Father here is interesting, right? Does that mean that we can't pray to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit? Of course not. Both of them are addressed in prayer in the Bible in different places. But all prayers eventually end up on the, <clears throat> excuse me, if I can put it this way, on the desk of the Father. Both the Holy Spirit and the Son, Jesus, are said to be those who make intercession for us. So the requests all end up at the same place at the end of the day anyway. Now, by the way, there is no precedent in Scripture for praying to saints or for praying to Mary or for praying to anybody else. In fact, the Bible is very clear. There is one mediator between God and man. It's the man, Christ Jesus. You don't get extra points by going to somebody. In fact, you're not praying when you go to someone else to pray. I mean, if you can go straight to the top, what would be the point of going somewhere else to pray? And that's what the Lord has provided us, access. Hebrews 4, 15, 16, access to the very throne of God. You know, when it's time to ask the boss for a raise, it can be a little scary, right? Feel a little intimidated about that? It's for sure you don't go in and call him daddy, right? That's not gonna be on the agenda. Even if you know he likes you and you have a pretty good relationship with him, he's still the guy that can shoot this whole idea down, right? And so we don't go in the same way. It's a whole different feeling from going to dad to ask for something. And God says, I want you to come to me as your father. That's the kind of feel I want you to have here. You know. Those of us who have had great earthly fathers maybe have a little bit of advantage, but even if you had a really bad earthly father, or maybe even if you lost your earthly father early in life, we all know what a great father can and should be, right? And that's who we address in prayer. Our heavenly father. He's our master, he's our guide, he's our shepherd, he's our helper, he's our provider, he's a thousand things to us. But the thing that's most wonderful of all to me is he is our father and he wants us to address him as such. There's, that, that word alone says so much, doesn't it? Our father. Now two needs addressed, related to the father. Number one, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. <clears throat> this sounds a little bit like adoration or praise and I think for most of my life that's what I thought it was. It was only later as I began to study this in more detail, I realized while there's an element of adoration and praise in this, it's a petition. It's a request. At the heart of it, this is a request. It's a request for God's name to be exalted. Hallowed, that word that's used here, is a form of the Greek word hagiadzo. It means to be holy. So we're praying for God's name to be made or to be declared holy. You can't make God any more holy than he already is, but you can desire for the holiness that is God to be known in the world in which we live, right? And that's what this request is about. You know, the, 
the term name in, in, in ancient days represented the whole individual, right? It was from the inside out, who is this individual? And it's interesting, God wants, his, wants this world to know him for who he is as holy. I think that's very telling. He doesn't say, let your name be declared love, for instance. Is God loving? Of course he is. That's the part, though, that most people don't have any problem getting their arms around. They're happy to embrace a God of love. So God is anxious for us to know the other side of the holiness is his, of his love is his holiness. And so he says, pray for that. Pray that people will understand me for who I am. It represents his whole character, his whole nature, his holiness defines him. And so number one on the list of things that Jesus says you ought to pray for is to pray that the world will see a holy God and know him for who he is. We want God's reputation to be lifted up. We want God to be seen for who he is rather than who we want him to be. So not, so not somebody that's been whittled down to human size, you know, to manageable size by human reason. Jesus is anxious that the Father be seen for the holy God that he truly is, that he be known for who he is, not for who we would like him to be. Holy speaks of two things, right? It speaks of his otherness. The root meaning of the word is separation. He's different from us. It's important that we understand that. He's other than us. He's far above us. It also speaks of his moral perfection. And so it is, it is the basis for morality. Sin, beloved, isn't, I mean, acts of sin Acts of sin are not at the core. They're not just violations of a law. They are that. But they are, the, 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 the reason sin is so awful is because it's a violation of God's holy character. That's why every single one declares God not to be worthwhile, declares that we know better than God. It violates his character. And so this request is that God's character be foremost in our mind what is usually far down the list of things that we might pray for, I, I venture to guess, would be a prayer that God's holiness would be manifested and would be known. But it's number one on Jesus' list, that he'll be known for who he is. And I think as we grow in him, we will grow in our desire that other people will see God in his holiness as well, that other people will know God for who he really is, you know, Hebrews tells us that our God is a consuming fire in his holiness. And he wants to be known that way. You know, now, how many of you ever seen God? Anybody here ever seen God? Nobody that's going to admit it, right? Of course we haven't seen God. Why? Because he's spirit. Isn't that what John 4 tells us? God is spirit. You can't see God. No man has seen God at any time, James tells us. So if we can't see God and we can't touch him, we can't feel him, how do we know what God is like. How do we know who God is? And the answer is there's only one way, through his self-revelation, right? Through the word. That's how we can know God. We can't define him. We can only accept what he says about himself. But while most of the people in our world today believe that God exists, most people do, they worship a God of their own definition. We've made him what we want him to be rather than accepting him for who he really is as he reveals himself in the word. The philosopher Blaise Pascal said this in, a, in an interesting way. He said, uh, <clears throat> he said, God made man in his own image. And then man turned around and returned the compliment. We've made God in our image. And then we turn around and worship that God who is not the true God at all. Let me give you one onerous example. It's found in um, Rabbi Harold Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have read it. It's on the bestseller list for a long time. The untimely death of his son caused Kushner to really begin to question his faith. He wrestled with how could this happen? 
I prayed, how could a good God let this happen? And he eventually comes to this conclusion. He said that God must have been powerless to prevent the tragedy. That's how he finally explains this in a way that he can somehow live with it. God must have been powerless to prevent this tragedy. God surely wanted to prevent this tragedy, but he was powerless to do it. And then he explains it this way. He said, I can worship a God who hates suffering but cannot eliminate it more easily than I can worship a God who chooses to make children suffer and die. In other words, I can only worship a God who conforms to my idea of reality, regardless of what he may have said about himself. That's a dangerous place to go, beloved. We can sympathize with Kushner's grief. We should sympathize with his grief. Some of you here know firsthand what his grief would be like, but his solution to define a diminished God and to turn around and to worship that God is nonsensical. What does the Bible reveal about God? This isn't a situation that's never come up before, right? Remember how Jesus in Luke 7, we studied it, raised the young man as he was going into the village of Nain who had died and the funeral was going on and Jesus raised the young man right then and there. Now, if God could raise him from the dead, could he have prevented him from dying? Of course he could have. He allowed it to happen for some greater Good. In this case, easy to see, to teach us that he has power over death. In other cases, not so easy to see, but always under his omnipotent control. And you know, if the rabbi needed an Old Testament example, it's there, right? In the, in the, in the case in 1 Kings 17 of Elijah, who raised the son of his landlord, right? When the boy died, Elijah raised him from the dead. Could God have prevented him from dying in the first place? If he could raise him from the dead, of course he could have prevented him from dying in the first place. He let him die for some greater good at that point in time. The death was not because God could not prevent it. It was because God in his magnificent greater vision than we knows far more than we do and knows there's a reason The fact that we disagree, beloved, with God's methods doesn't give us the right to redefine him. The fact that we disagree with God's methods doesn't give us the right to redefine him. It only gives us the right to worship him. God isn't going to conform himself to our specifications. Here's the thing we have to realize. It would be horrible for us if he did. We think it would be good because we think we know best and we don't. Thank God he doesn't conform himself to our definition and our specifications. But to worship a God that we've made up in our own minds, can you see that at the end of the day that's just to worship self? What fool would worship himself? Now, usually the redefinition of God takes the form of a God who is only loving, right? He loves, I can accept a God who loves, I cannot accept a God who judges, accept a God of wrath against sin, I cannot accept that. We sacrifice God's holiness to his love, but of course the Bible presents God as being both. It's two sides to the same God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that he really couldn't be one without the other. He couldn't be loving if he wasn't someday going to judge sin and put it all away and, do it, do, do, and get everything completely right. How would you like to live in a world where there was no hope of sin and evil and wickedness being brought to an end? It's the love of God that makes sure that that's going to happen. These are just two sides of the same coin. A God would be a monster that was like that. That's where human reason leads us. So we're praying for God's name to be hallowed. We're praying for the world to recognize the greatness of the holiness of God. And we need to go a little deeper, though. 
did you and I get involved in this? You knew that was coming, right? We get involved in this. Leviticus 22, turn there with me. Third book in the Bible, that most edifying of Old Testament books that I'm sure you've been reading this week, no doubt. Leviticus 22, it really is a wonderful book. It's not nearly as surface as some of the other ones though, right? Tough. But, but here's one that's not that tough. Leviticus 22. We're praying for God's character to be known, right? We're praying for his holiness to be exhibited. How does that happen? The fact is there's a common thread that runs through the passages of Scripture that speak to this issue. And one of the early ones is in Leviticus 22. Look at this, beginning in verse 31. Leviticus 22 Verse 31, <clears throat> God speaking to Israel says, so you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord, not you, in other words. I am the Lord and you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified. It's the same word as is used in Luke. Hebrew version of the same Greek word that's used there. That I may be hallowed, that I may be made declared holy among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So he's saying, I want you to live out the sanctification that I will give to you, but as you do that, as you follow my commands, then my name will be hallowed rather than profaned. So how is God's name hallowed? It's hallowed when we obey his commands, including the ones we don't think are right, including the ones that are politically incorrect including the ones that go against the grain of what we want. We declare his name to be hallowed. When we do that, we declare it to be profaned when we disobey. We declare him when we do that to be of no worth. We, we proclaim ourselves to be smarter than he is. We proclaim ourselves to be wiser than God. We proclaim his name to be profaned and our name to be lifted up. That's what we do when we disobey. Now, it happens to all of us. It happened to the best of us. We read about it this morning in Numbers 12, the very next book. If you're in Leviticus, just turn over to Numbers 12. Here's, here's Moses. As he comes, as God has told him to speak to the rock to get water out of it for the people. But, it's, but, but once before, when this happened, he struck the rock. And so in his anger against the people, he strikes the rock again. <clears throat> And God says in Numbers 20, verse 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to uphold me as holy. You didn't uphold me as holy, you disobeyed. Because you didn't believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land. Listen, beloved, you don't just hurt God when you disobey, you hurt yourself, you can't. You get away with it for a while. It feels good for a while. The pleasure is wonderful for a while. The Bible recognizes that. It tells you there's pleasure in sin for a while. But there's an end because why? Because every act of disobedience profanes the name of God rather than hallows it. And that will not go on forever. God wants his character to be affirmed and we're part of the process before a waiting world to display the holiness of God by keeping his commandments. They may not agree with everything that we do, but they will be confronted with the holiness of God. It gives them an opportunity to make their decision. Our obedience gives other people the opportunity to make their decision whether they will follow God or whether they will not. Our obedience to God's plans, then, even the ones that are contrary to cultural norms, signal that he is right and that we are wrong. That hallows his name. And we, when we pray for God's name to be hallowed, beloved, we're praying for us to follow his commands. When we pray for his name to be hallowed and then we turned around and disobey, we're nothing but hypocrites bringing his name down. By our obedience, we are saying with Paul, let, every, let God be true and every man a liar. That's what we're saying. 
Let your name be hallowed. The second thing in this prayer, back in Luke 11, with regard to God is, let your kingdom come, right? Let your kingdom come. Now, we're gonna see this over and over as we continue through the book of Luke, but uh, you have to understand this or you will miss large parts of really of the New Testament. There are two aspects, two elements, two parts, if you will, to the kingdom of God. If you understand these, it will help you understand the Bible. If you don't, you, you get lost. There are two parts. The first part is God's rule in the hearts of believers. That's the kingdom of God. God's rule in the hearts of believers. We accept him as Lord. We accept him as king, just like we sang about this morning. He's our ruler. He's the one who's in charge. And so his kingdom is residing within us. This is this, we're, we're kingdom people. We're kingdom people. So it isn't true of the Old Testament saints, but it's true of us. The kingdom has come. When Jesus said the kingdom has come, kingdom, repent for the kingdom is at hand, he wasn't kidding. And those who became believers and those who accepted him, let him become the ruler in their life, were part of the kingdom. They were kingdom people. It's in this sense that Jesus could say the kingdom of God is in the midst of you in Luke 17, 21. It's in this sense that Jesus could say to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36, it's in this sense that Paul could say, but our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. We are members of the kingdom now. In that sense, the kingdom is here. There's a now sense to the kingdom. It's here now. But there's a second aspect to the kingdom. There's a future aspect to the kingdom. There's a culmination to the kingdom. And it's when God will, through the person of Christ, will rule and reign on this earth as the king, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, as the one that's in charge of everything. And those who are part of his kingdom because they've accepted him into their hearts and he's ruled there will now be part of this political kingdom, this outward kingdom. God's rule will extend beyond the hearts of believers into every realm, heavenly and earthly, physical and spiritual. The kingdom will come in that sense and that's the sense in which Jesus is asking us to pray here. He is the king. He's on the ground as he's giving them this prayer. And yet he can say there's some sense in which the kingdom is yet to come. He actually uses the aorist tense, the Greek aorist tense, which means a point in time action. He's saying pray for the kingdom to come at some point in time. It's not here yet in its ultimate sense, in its final sense. Pray for that. That's what he's saying he wants us to be concerned about that. He wants us to look for the time when his rulership in our hearts now extends out into all realms of reality. When, when finally there is just, when finally there's just one will in the whole of the world and it's the will of God. See, that's the goal. That's why it's so important for us to you know, learn how to line up with the will of God. We're just, pre, we're just previewing what's gonna be ultimately in the kingdom of God. That's why in Matthew's version of this prayer, Jesus adds a line that he doesn't give in the one that Luke has here, which is to pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, in heaven, there's just one will. There's not any alienation. There's no trouble. There's no disagreements. There's no problems. Because there's one will, and it's the will of God. And, and he's saying, I want you to pray for that to be true on earth as well. I want that to be part of your being that you want to see this happen. This should drive us. In the ultimate sense, the kingdom is the extension of God's will to every nook and corner of the universe. And he's saying, pray for that. Pray for that. Can you see that Jesus is giving us a really big vision here? Do you see that? He's trying to take us out of our little self-contained world where our prayers are pretty much selfish, where they're pretty much self-centered, where they're 
pretty much short-sighted just for the near term. And there's nothing wrong with those. I don't want to discourage that. But beloved, he's, he's urging us have a bigger picture that you, bigger context that you put all of those into. Long for the kingdom of Jesus Christ to come to earth and pray for it. Get, 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 get out of, you know, just the worry about the everyday thing. Listen, listen, listen. Let me give you a practical, you know, application. You don't like the way the government's going? Don't pray for Obama and Congress. Don't pray them out. Pray Jesus in. That's where he's going? That's a short-term solution, and probably not even that. Whatever we get, just as likely to be worse or what, right? But not if Jesus is the one. Pray for Jesus to be ruling. Pray for the kingdom. We don't do that, do we? We're way too short-sighted, beloved. We, this is not on our radar, but it's in the prayer, the model prayer that he gives us. Pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for that. Get a bigger picture. Pray that the things that are going on in your life are, are representing the kingdom because you're a kingdom person. Pray that God's will would be worked out in such a way that the kingdom is displayed. When it all goes wrong, pray that God is somehow doing something that you can't even imagine, but it's forwarding the kingdom. I love what Peter does. Peter takes us even a step further. 2 Peter 3.11, listen to this. Just listen. 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 11, he says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, all the earthly things, all the things, he's reminding us that the things we pray for most are all gonna go away. They're all gonna go away. Two things are going to survive this world. The word of God and your soul. That's it. The souls of people and the word of God are the only things that are going to survive and they're the things we think least about and pray least about. Pray for the kingdom. Peter says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, and listen, and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the earthly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let me tell you, here's, I'll tell you what our problem is. We've lived so long with this earth, we got used to it. We don't understand. It isn't going to be forever. We're just like the mockers who say it's been 2,000 years and he isn't come. And what did Peter say? Yeah, it's 2,000 years. The day with the Lord is like 1,000 years. So it's been two days in God time. It's coming. You just don't believe it. And the problem is neither do believers. We don't have this vision. To pray in context for the big things. I mean, are you tired of the way things are? Then pray for the kingdom to come. Are you tired for wrong, you know, triumphing over right, for stupidity over common sense? Pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for Jesus to come. Peter suggests we can hasten the coming of the Lord. I don't know how that works, but that's what he says. I'd guess if you took the number of times believers pray for the kingdom to come, it would be really, really, really small. And then we wonder, why doesn't it happen? So at the beginning of this prayer, Jesus is urging us to be praying for the big picture for the time when the effective rule of God will extend to the whole world. And the obvious implication of this is if we're, if we're concerned for the big picture and for God's rule to be extended to the whole world, we'll automatically be concerned that his rule be extended in our own personal lives, right? That'll become important to us, maybe more important than it is now. It'll become critical to us. In fact, we do this long enough and pretty soon his will becomes our will. That's really the goal. His will becomes our will. And we begin to live, live out in truth what Matthew says in 633, right? When he, says, when he says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Last time you prayed for a new job, the last time you prayed for your kid to get well, the last time you prayed for something in your life, did you pray first for the kingdom of God? Did you? Really? 
And I, you know, this isn't about a guilt trip, beloved. This is about living in the good of who we are. Who, we're kingdom people. Let's pray like kingdom people. Let's live like kingdom people. Let's have desires like kingdom people. David Brinkley, in his, uh, in his book, Brinkley's Beat, I always liked him as a news anchor because I thought he didn't take himself quite as seriously as most of them do. I liked him. I think he was, probably his politics weren't the same as mine, but at least he didn't take it so seriously. But he, t- he tells about the great respect that was accorded to Lyndon Johnson when he was whatever else you think about him, one of the most respected Senate majority leaders in history. Without question, he was. And Brinkley says, I was walking down the halls of Congress one day and I heard a couple of young senators talking and one of them said, why are we passing this bill? Do do you even know what it's about? And the other one responded, no, I really don't know what it's about, but I just know Lyndon wants it and that's good enough for me. Okay. I'm not suggesting that that makes a good senator. I don't think it does because Lyndon Johnson wasn't perfect. But I'll tell you what, it would make a good Christian because God is perfect. And when you want the will of God, you're wanting the right thing. Get the big picture. In this model prayer, God is saying, get oriented. Before you start asking about your needs, ask that God's character would be revealed in this world and ask that his kingdom would come quickly. That's the right orientation. That's the right way to be. Get the big picture. We had a, I was working at Motorola one time, they had some economist come in, fairly well-known lady, to talk about the recession that was going on at the time. And she came in and, she started her talk like this. She took a piece of paper and she took her uh, pen, made a, you know, a, a little dot there, black dot, right in the middle of the piece of paper. And then she held it up to the, somebody that was on the first row and said, what do you see? He said, I see a black dot. She held it up to another guy and said, what do you see? He said, I see a black dot. I don't know, probably half a dozen people said, I see a black dot. Well, when she got all done, she'd made her point. She said, yeah, there's a little black dot there. But it's interesting, none of you talked about the whole big sheet of white paper all around the black dot. You're just seeing a little thing. That's what this introduction to this prayer is about. What Jesus is saying is, you guys pray about the little black dot. I'm interested in the black dot. I care about the black dot. But you will do much better when you begin to see the big picture and when you begin to pray about the black dot in the context of the big picture. When you begin to put the things that are in your life and that are important to you in the big picture of his honor, of his will, of his character, of his reputation, of his kingdom being known on earth, then you'll get it right. Take the long, take the long view. That's what he's saying. Don't squander the opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We acknowledge, Lord, we pray seldom for your name to be hallowed and for our lives to be part of that process. We frankly have, frankly, we've given up on seeing your kingdom come in our lifetime. But we have. Yeah, in theory, we know you can come any time, but but the practical side of it is we don't really think it's going to happen. And so we don't live in the good of it, we don't pray for it, and it doesn't inform our decisions. Lord, I'd ask you to change that. I ask you to change that in my life. I, I of all people, as you as you know and as you do to me every week, I need this sermon more than anybody here. 
to be reminded what's important, to be reminded where I'm going. So I pray that you would change us, that you would use us, that you would sharpen us, and that you would help us not to squander the wonderful privilege of prayer that you've given to us. It is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we ask this. Amen.